Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started um, quickly now because two of our uh, panelists uh, have to leave a little early. One at 3.15, uh, one at uh, 3.30, um, weather related uh, travel issues. Uh, so uh, let me just invite, uh, I want to invite questions. Jeff, they don't have to necessarily be tied to topic or anything, but you know, we've got just this incredible group of people here, and I thought it'd be this, you know, um, a, an opportunity just to, just to inquire, if you will, about what was interesting to, to us. So, um, it's David Sellers who will be leaving at 3.15. If there are any questions for him or for Jean Polisinski, he'll be leaving at 3.30. Um, I would uh, suggest that... Uh, get him out of Get him out of the way. <laughs> I have a question for David. Good. So you mentioned Pacer, which is I don't a great. Think we're allowed to do this. Are we? <laughs> you are. Okay? You are. Go ahead. You mentioned Pacer, which is a great resource. It allows you to get access to all the federal court filings, but it's expensive. Yeah. And I don't know that it needs to be quite that expensive. And what can you tell us about what the court system might be trying to do about making access to Pacer authentically public and easy? Well, I I think if by you, by meaning authentically public and easy, you mean free. It's not like the rest of the internet. <laughs> well, it's, it's an expensive system to run. So I think if you could convince Congress to appropriate the money to run it, but right now Congress is very happy that it's, it's fees that run it, but they don't have to provide funds to run it. And actually the, the, the costs have changed over the years, have gone up and down per page, but relatively new is a, is a cap that if you don't spend um, $15 in a quarter, you don't get charged anything. So there are something like 90% of the people who use PACER get charged nothing. It's just the heavy users who are, who are getting paid. So, you know, yeah, I, I recognize that some of the heavy users may be, may be sitting here. So. I don't, I'm sure I'd be told that I was free for a month, and that certainly hasn't happened. Yeah. Well, in David's defense, that's one of the things we're grappling with in Missouri as we're rolling out e-filing. Um, and CaseNet's always been free. And, and access to e-filing at this point is free. And the court is cognizant that once you provide something for free, it's very hard to charge for it. At the same time, the number one question I always get is, I want it remotely. Everybody wants it remotely. We get two million hits a day on CaseNet on an average day. And we have been given no additional resources to try to do this. So we're building this and rolling it out in-house. Um, and, and so we can't go very quickly because we have no extra resources. Um, and I know that that's one of the questions that they're going to be grappling with as they move toward the public side, um, is how, how do we build an infrastructure that works and works well and works consistently? Because once you get a PACER, you freak out if suddenly you go and try to get on PACER and it doesn't work. Um, I mean, once you have that access, people tend to rely on it and, and you can't do that for free. Um, and so, you know, for those of you who are interested, I'm sure you know, like David said, you know, the, the policymakers, um, you know, if, if they if they see the need from the public, perhaps it will be something they'll consider a higher priority. You want to jump in? Well, I just think uh, what we're talking about is interesting is the cost of access, the nature of access to the records, and this this comes up with my desire to, as they say, revise and extend my remarks. I live in Washington, you say that about every eight minutes, <laughs> um, and that is that I. Uh, in being asked today to paint a picture of what is, which was pretty gloomy, I really didn't get to the part where I think it is looking better. Uh, in fact, I have colleagues uh, on our board and, and uh, who, I work with who would say that we're coming into, and I know this is going to go the other direction, what will eventually be called the golden era of journalism. Now, it doesn't look like it right now, but we forget that the iPhone came out in, what, uh, six years ago? that the internet is a teenager, that a lot of the economic whack at the industry that happened at the end, in the 90s, the end of the 90s and the start of this century, it resembles what happened in journalism almost 100 years earlier when we moved from very localized, uh, dependent journalism opinion and, and revenue sources and often supported by uh, political interests to penny press, and there was a sudden explosion of news, and, and I think one of the, the real saving graces here is that we don't know yet what we don't know about how news information is going to be spread. Mm -hmm. 
and that the one thing that you can hold on to, two, maybe these are part of you, is that people need news and information in order to function. And that credibility will ultimately, I think, come to the top as a absolute necessity to survive in an internet age. We've moved from toy to tool to necessity in terms of the way we view the web. A lot of the institutions and the kinds of reporting that we see have not caught up with that yet for one reason or another. I, I think there's great future in micropayments for news as opposed to a, just a fixed fee to have access. Pay a fraction of a penny for a piece every time you click it. And we're, we're seeing that model. So that's one reason I like with some hesitancy, Bezos and Omidyar and others coming in who have learned to monetize other professions. Now, Bezos basically took the Sears catalog and, and made it work in an internet age. Uh, somebody will do that with the way we sold newspapers and, and marketed television and turn that into the internet age golden goose. And once again, people will pay in small amounts totaling up to large amounts of money to support news organizations. So uh, we're in a very much in a transition phase and that's the thing that we can't do right now is really, we, we should worry, yes, but we all is not lost because there are very smart people out there and there is this need on the other end to have the news and information about the courts, about how things function. People will pay for that down the road. Charles is, is a bit worried. Uh, I'm worried for David. Uh, he's, got, he's got five minutes. Does anybody have a question for David? I actually do, but I want to invite uh, anyone else who has a question uh, for David Sellers. So, David, if, um, if I'm a student, um, either a law student or a journalism student, and I want to be you instead of Tony Lewis. I'd be Tony Lewis. <laughs> You'd be Tony Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> well, how would I do that? I mean, what's, what does the path look like? Uh, well, I already confessed to not being a lawyer. Uh, so that's good news because I don't have to go to law school. Yeah. Well, is you know, that the best thing I don't. No, no, no. The uh, you know my background is journalism, and I'll, I'll tell a real, real quick story because it does involve the other Tony, Tony House, uh, that I was working for a paper in Washington at the time, and this will will date everything. That I wanted to get some statistics. So I looked in the phone book, which is what you did at the time, and I called this agency called the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, which I'd never heard of, and got passed around about five different people, and finally I got to the deputy director of the agency, who said he faxed me the statistics, which is also what you did at the time, and I said to him, you really need like a public information officer or somebody like that, and he said, I'd be interested to hear about it. Come see me sometime. Well, I also knew Tony House at the Supreme Court, and she came together and helped me, and together we created this position that I've been in for the past 26 years. So, and an office that's grown, and does websites, and we have a TV station, and you know, media relations and educational outreach, but started as just, just one person. So, you know, find a need, find a place where there's a need, and know people, and uh, <laughs> have a little one luck. Those, one of those courts where there's not currently an officer. Or yeah, and, uh, it's a tough that's economic that's environment. That's part of the problem. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Any other questions for uh, David? Uh, in the words of the court, we will thank and excuse. One final word. <laughs> one final word on Pacer. You know, maybe we would have done it differently if we started all over again. But once you go down this road, we went to Congress and said we want to start an electronic system for accessing court records, and they said, "Great, but we're not going to give you any money." and they never have given any money, you can't turn back. So um, the money that PACER brings in has set up electronic courtrooms around the country, the evidence presenta presentation systems, it's the, uh, the way jurors um, file for jury service now electronically, the whole electronic case filing system, where every case is filed electronically, it's all funded by PACER. So if you stopped, if you made PACER, <coughs> PACER free, there have to be some other way to pay for these other whether that's laying off employees or Congress appropriating more money, I don't know. So on that final happy note. Howard, since you're a frequent user, any, any more comments me. on Pacer? Or thank you. You're good? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David, by the way, did not mention that he is a former president of the Conference of Court Public Information Officers. So his leadership has been essential to a lot of people around the country. So thanks, David. <laughs> There was only one point that was 
brought up in the context of PACER and electronic records, and I think one of the folks out here about the notion that we hear that it's scary that information is now too readily available. Um, and in, in the context of the plea agreements, for example, in federal courts, our district, for example, you cannot get the plea agreement online. You have to go to the courthouse to get a plea agreement. I find that ridiculous. Um, it, it's, there's absolutely no justification for it. I mean, if somebody pleads out in a drug case, you know they're cooperating with the government. Period, and they're not going to have the you know the, the confidential informant's name in there. I mean, if there's some legitimate reason that a plea agreement should be under seal, it can be under seal. I mean, there's not there there, but it's the exception, not the rule. And every single plea agreement in our district, if if it's in San Francisco, I'm in San Jose. I can't. I got to drive there for a public document that I can get if I go to the clerk's office. This idea that because something is readily available, it's too scary to put online just doesn't make any sense to me. It's counterintuitive. I completely agree. If the bad guys want to find out, they'll go to the courthouse. And then if it's going to be sealed, it should be sealed for all purposes. But this notion that it's open to the public, but only to the public with the resources to go to the courthouse is problematic. I also, I, I thought I'd wait for David to leave, leave the room before offering that rebuttal. <laughs> um, I think just casually admitting that it's a cash cow that this access to public information is used to fund all this worthy stuff. That's crazy. It shouldn't talk, it costs three bucks to get a brief on Baser. I click the button, I don't care, the Times pays for it. But I don't think that's true of most people. I think this is a very problematic thing that government records should be that expensive. Can it really cost three bucks for a document? Well, and, and if you get right down to it, it's sort of, it, I, I really think philosophically, it should cost what it costs and not a penny more, right. or but, else but, it's but double taxation. Apparently we're ordering pizzas for jurors with this money. Yeah. Yeah. There's some journals that would be done there. There's, there was an organization that really has or is or was going after PACER uh, on some of these policy questions. I forget who it was, and, but there was some group that sort of, it's, it, it, matter of fact, I think they were literally buying Pacer stuff and putting it online to, to yeah. undermine yeah, Pacer. Yeah, they were accessing it on, on the free days. There, there were experiments making it free in certain areas, and they were downloading it wholesale and Rebel making it available. Pacer. It's uh, just you. Right, right. Yeah, that, that same tactic, but more just openly antagonistic, was used in FOI all the time, where mm -hmm. suddenly a document that cost a penny to really retrieve was they were trying to charge ten or fifteen dollars a sheet, and <coughs> and there, uh, for different reasons, you were able to repeat that a lot of times. And frankly, the good work of the coalition beat that back. But I mean, you really got a sense of the real cost because they would be charging ten or fifteen dollars a sheet, and it turned out to be a yeah. fraction of a penny to produce. Well, and, uh, and a lot of the states have these sort of dated. Uh, laws that really need to be updated for a digital age, and so the governments can take advantage of them. Yeah. Missouri is a fine example. Where there's government agencies in Missouri are still not mandated to produce a document in digital format. So I had any number of reporters that would call me, they'd be dealing with the city government, getting a contract. Yeah. Be 300 pages long, the city would go, yeah, come over and pick it up, it's $175. Because right. we're going to take a PDF that is sitting on our desktop and print it. Because they can. Instead of a link that lets you call it up. And, well, yeah, it's, me, it's, me, and they mask those charges. I mean, it's not, it's not the production cost <coughs> we're talking about. They, they mask them behind the re alleged research that goes mm -hmm. behind it. You've already done the research to know what you want, so. Yeah, in this case, it was a contract that literally, the clerk was helpful enough to go, yeah, right here on my desktop, PDF. Yeah. But I can't give it to you electronically because <coughs> I don't have to. Yeah, testing uh, Beth's uh, uh, skills. Uh, <laughs> you all are looking at this issue. These are, this is what, this is your future. Um, I mean, for years when I would get reporters calling me, but back before, well, we had briefs online, um, but I was telling somebody at lunch that, you know, that wasn't, the reason our Court of Appeals didn't do it is they called me and said, how did you do it? And I would explain to them the process I had to go through to take these briefs that sometimes lawyers couldn't figure out how to file them in all one document, so you'd get the cover page, <laughs> table of contents, table of authorities, introduction, <laughs> points relied on like 12 pieces, and I'd have to be PDFing all those things and then shoving them together into one thing. So it, it took some, some staff output for me to get those things online, but the Supreme Court doesn't have nearly as many cases as the Court of Appeals does. 
Um, so the Court of Appeals kind of said, yee, we don't have the staff to do that. Um, and they'd still make them available upon request when somebody would call, but, but if there were other documents that were filed in our court, um, we've never charged the media for documents. And so somebody might call me up and say, hey, I, I saw in CaseNet that blah, blah, blah was filed. Can you get me a copy? And I'd go over to the clerk's office and they'd pull the file apart and photocopy it for me. And then I would take the photocopy to my copier and I'd scan it in and then I'd email it. Sometimes in many chunks, um, I started to discover the limitations on other people's email. Mm -hmm. But I would just, I'd get it to them as, as easily as I could. And the only time I've been there 12 and a half years and the only time we ever charged anybody for anything was when um, NPR in DC was following um, a death penalty case, and I don't remember now which one it was, but they needed everything in the file, it was four <coughs> boxes. And so we copied it, and all we wanted was their shipping number. And so all we paid, all we charged them for was physically shipping that paper to them. Does this ever get fixed when we just totally go to E work? I mean, you know, I, I, mean I, I know I appreciate the, the boxes because a lot of times that's the really complex mm -hmm. litigation that people want to dive into. Pacer is, but, uh, Pacer is that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I, you know, I keep thinking there's a remedy here, which is at some point, but then again, if it's being used, you know, like toll roads to pay for other things, uh, it ne the problem never gets fixed. You know, I think there's a toll road in Indiana that's paid for like 59, and, and the prices <laughs> keep tripling <laughs> to pay for all the other work that they can get out of it, you know. But uh, e-filing, to me, should, at some point, the rational thing is to say, fine, here it is. I, I, there's some cost, but it's a very low friction kind yeah, of cost. It's yeah. not a $10, uh, ten cents a page cost. Yeah, yeah. So there's the uh, cash cow problem. <laughs> yeah. um, I was curious, we've heard today about some worries that people have <laughs> about the accusations that fly between judges and lawyers and, and journalists. Um, for, for law students who are going to teach lawyers, what's the takeaway either, what can we do to address some of those worries and or be a partner, or at least not exacerbate some of the yeah. challenges or the, the barriers between the journalists and the legal system. Well, there will always be an inherent conflict. I mean, there's always going to be a tension. But I think clarity in opinion, uh, hiring a PIO to, to, to make things as public as possible, uh, being willing to meet periodically in our meetings, one of the things that came out of this 15 year series is a series of periodic quarterly meetings or whatever with people who are interested in what's going on in the courts just to hear what are the concerns and what are the potential solutions. Uh, being open to that. Uh, you know, I, I, when we started in 99, there was two armed camps. And, and uh, the only time we ever came close to really seeing that again was in, we met in Kansas City two weeks after disclosures about federal judges in there uh, uh, where they had interest in a case, maybe even though it was a blind trust, and two of the judges who we were participating in, two of the reporters we had participating, they had been written about by those guys. We had a very interesting afternoon session, but that's sort of out of the way. The, the, more, they, the more the groups talked, the more they found they had more in common than in opposition. Then one of the I, I would say for um, law students and or journalism students, um, at the risk of sounding a little cliche, trust and transparency. Um, I, I say to groups of judges, uh, you should apply the same standards to deciding whether to take a reporter into your chambers on background that you would apply to hiring a babysitter or a mechanic for your really expensive car. Um, you wouldn't take someone who was fresh off the road or who had a bad reputation and talk to them on background risking that they would burn you. So I would never suggest to a judge that they talk to anybody off the street to explain what a motion in limine is just because they got a press card. On the other hand, <coughs> if Adam Lipton is the guy who is calling and he's been covering the courts for the New York Times for six years, or Howard Mintz, then just as you would apply discernment in your real life, you say, okay, well, I can trust this guy. Or he's referred by somebody, you've read his stuff. So I always tell judges, you shouldn't just talk to any old blog or some guy a woman, you know, blogging from their mama's basement in their daddy's underwear, to Joe Bagley. <laughs> but if the person has credibility, you should, and, and some journalists may not agree with this, but if the person has credibility as a judge or as a PIO, I say you don't just do the required amount of interaction, you actually take that person on background 
and you almost assist in training them so that they do a better job for your local community. Yeah, I think that's excellent advice. You should always talk to Howard and me. <laughs> Nobody, else. particularly if it's exclusive. That's right. There you go. A couple of things well there. One, and, and I think you know, there's a there's a separate part of this of how lawyers deal with journalists and. Generally, once lawyers start to do some higher profile cases, their comfort level grows with dealing with reporters and, and they actually want the press because they're egomaniacs and all that kind of stuff. So there's that. The, the judge issue is, is, is an interesting one because I think my experience almost from the beginning is judges aren't as bad as we think they are about dealing with journalists. They just don't like to admit that they deal with journalists. Um, some of them, it's just no way, they're not comfortable with it, they're never gonna be comfortable with it, and that's fine, you respect that. Um, but, and part of it is, what I, what I was sort of getting at this morning is, is, the, is the people part of this. I mean, you know, I didn't always have credibility. You know, I was starting out, so I had to establish that with judges, and that takes time, and that takes effort, and it doesn't show up in, a story right away and so forth. I mean, so you have to build that trust um, as a reporter. So if you're a journalism student, you know, you, judges can be a scary thing, but as it turns out, a lot of them, just because they're so insulated in their lives, that they sort of welcome conversations with journalists at a certain level. Um, so. Yeah, one of the real life example, I'm sorry, no, 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 no. Just a real exa example that comes from our first one in 99. The reporter for the San Francisco, uh, was either Chronicle or Examiner, who there was a judge there, and the judge had written an early opinion dealing with Microsoft. And in that, he had this sequence of cases that go, went back to the issue of the era of telegraphy. And, and apparently, he had been, some people had been very critical about why he included it. The reporter said, You know, I tried to reach you, but it was one of those across the table, and, and I wanted to explain. And, and, can you talk about now why? He, he said, well, I wanted to go back and show that even though this president setting, setting decision on Microsoft, that, the, that this was not unanticipated and it was a string of cases. Anyway, they set it up much better than that, but the context was that opinion would have been explained so much better had there just been a way for the exchange to have taken place in their minds about six years earlier. And it, it wouldn't have violated, I think, anything. It just would have explained a little more why he went to that Agree to put that line of cases in that decision. Uh, maybe not. I, actually, I think it was poorly written, or it should have been obvious. But nonetheless, it, it would have <coughs> the public would have benefited because they they would have seen what was at the time decried as this out of the blue decision. In his mind, was rooted in law that was more than a hundred years old, and and they just didn't talk because he didn't talk to reporters. And she made one call and gave up, and it was it was just a really interesting exchange that I've always taken through all the way through our sequence. That one little two-minute conversation, probably in our meeting, would have made a huge difference in the way they reported that one story. Excellent. Yeah, let me just hold off on this just one second. I want to thank and excuse uh, Gene <laughs> Polisinski. Uh, people want to thank and excuse him because um, I, I'm worried uh, about his uh, making his, uh, his flight. Thank you for the so, opportunity. So, <laughs> so can, um, is this on topic? Is it same topic? Yeah. Same topic. Uh, okay. uh, because I have two people up here who want to respond as well. You go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, that, go so ahead. Charles, I after you. Yeah. Or actually, okay. now I want to respond as well, I think. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I totally agree with that. I, I, I don't think reporters should resist calling judges or trying to, to meet with them, because very often you'll be surprised. Uh, I did a piece on how Marshall, Texas became one of the uh, centers of the universe for IP cases mm -hmm. uh, a long time ago. And uh, just on a whim, I walk, walked into uh, the judge's office, federal judge in, in Marshall, Texas, and uh, oh yeah, come on in. And he explained to me exactly how it happened. I won't go into that story here, but, but uh, it, it gave me pers perspective. It gave me everything I needed for the story. Charles? I was going to mention that for many happy years, I taught a, a class to judges out in Reno, Nevada. Uh, in fact, Ben was in my classroom a couple of times, and one of the things that stuck with me forever was that I brought in a local courts reporter who, who two of the judges in the class, it just turned out that year, it was just dynamic. Two of my judges that year were local Reno judges, 
they were royally ticked off at this reporter. I didn't know, so you know, blunderbuss that I am. I'm like, come in and talk to the judges. <laughs> we get there, and the room is sort of crackling with tension. But as they got to talking with each other, I noticed it started smoothing out almost instantly because they were communicating. And at some point in it, one of the judges during a break said, I really appreciate you bringing her in. I don't know if that was intentional, but there's a lot of sort of bogeymanism that goes on because we don't see each other. And when she was finishing up, she said something that stuck with me, and I've always told the judges out at the, the National Judicial College this. She said, look, at the end of the day, I got right about you one way or the other. And come 5.30 this evening, I'm going to be filed. So you can either sit in your chambers and hate me, or you can help me. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the choice you have as both a lawyer and a judge. You can take on this educative role, which is a hassle. You're going to be breaking in a new greenhorn about every year, year and a half. That's the reality of it. As soon as you get somebody halfway understanding your job, then knock, 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 there's going to be some new kid walking in, and you're going to have to start all over again. But guess what? The product that you will read in the morning when you get up will make you much less angry on a daily basis if you have invested that time. Now, let me just uh, exercise the privilege of the chick. Beth, you really want me as a reporter going straight to one of your judges. That's okay. I, I mean, I, I don't mind. It, it, I so Barrett McGurn has no place in today's no, public I, information? No, I don't think that's right. I mean, most reporters go through me, but like I said, I, I and I facilitate getting them to a judge. Um, but that doesn't mean that I didn't frequently pick up, like I said earlier, the post-dispatch and I'd read something and I'd think, yeah, this really sounds like Judge Wolf's words. And they would have just called him because they had a relationship with him. And he'd had this conversation with him. And, you know, you all heard him. He's full of sort of these great pithy quotes. And so some of those words would start showing up in stories and I could tell that he, that the reporter would exercise the relationship that they had with the judge. And that's great because, I mean, we're not about hiding things. To, to follow up on, on your question, and I think some of the things that have been said, I teach media relations um, as part of my job to judges and court staff. And I will tell you, I mean, you have to step back and remember that journalism at the end of the day is about storytelling. And stories are driven by people. And without people, you can't write a very good story. And those are all based on relationships that are built over time. So I will talk to judges and encourage them to go get to know the reporters in their local town. Even if they seem to change every six months, which sometimes they do, um, make an effort to get to at least know the assignment editor or the editor. Uh, because it's much more comfortable to have a conversation when they're not calling you with a story. And then when they do call you and they have a question, you're like, okay, I'm not afraid of that person. I know that person and I, I'm okay talking with them. Um, the other thing I will say to the journalism students in the room is that every time something bad happens, even before the days of social media, um, all the judges knew about it. I, to this day, am dealing with judges who are still upset about the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, or there will be some reporter who will have shown up in somebody's courtroom and acted badly or done something badly. And, in, and I know that these are just teensy little blips on the radar, but those bad little blips get communicated to everybody and suddenly all the judges are afraid. And um, and likewise, I'm sure there's been some, I, I know there have been some bad circumstances of judges not responding well, and that kind of flies through the media. But I think the more that everyone tries to have a conversation with each other, and going back to what you can do as a law student, one of the journalism professors asked earlier, how do I go find somebody to talk to to help explain whatever this thing is that just happened? So I think if lawyers can make themselves more accessible, not just about their own cases, but if you practice in the area of estates and, and trusts, and you know, there's some interesting thing that happens with, with a will. Call the reporter up and say, hey, you know, I'm available. If you need help with this issue, I can help you help walk you through on background what the heck these things mean. So I think that we can all work together to make the stories better at the end of the day. Sounds good. We're fortunate to have uh, Richard Gard, who's the publisher of his words weekly uh, with us. And uh, he'll ask the next question. Yeah, thanks. Um, We've talked a lot today, uh, you know, sort of by terms of nostalgia, by terms of lamentation, you know, really there are lots of worries talking about the economics of the industry, which I live every day, and I agree with all your worries and, and some others that you probably were too polite to mention. But I want to shift the discussion a little bit, because regardless of all of that stuff, the reality is that, and I guess this is for Alan and Howard, maybe Adam, um, your readership, our readership is changing also. It's a new generation of readers 
with different tastes and different interests, and, it's a, and the culture has changed from those good old days. Uh, of the types of, I'm just so. I guess the question is, how has that changed your uh, your priorities and what you cover, how you cover things, how you present things? Um, how has your coverage changed to better meet the needs and interests of the current generation, the current culture of your readers? I guess I'll try that first. Um, I, I guess my, I, I have a couple of assumptions going in. The first one is that, that that's kind of what a lots of publications do anyway. They try to meet certain tastes at their, uh, certain places in, whether it's a magazine or a newspaper. Newspapers uh, were wonderful because you could have different sections of the paper and if you had a family, uh, each person in the family would pick up a different section of the newspaper anyway. Um, I view what we do because we write about the law, but I view it the same way. Everybody has sort of a different taste in what they want or a different, uh, they're, they're looking for a different kind of experience. Uh, our Unlike a lot of trade publications, what we try to do at the ABA Journal is to have a broader experience for the broad range of lawyers that we have. Uh, if you're a tax lawyer, you're already getting all these bulletins and, and publications that are very specific about tax law. You know, you're not going to pick up the ABA Journal and learn anything about tax law. But you may learn something about uh, something that's taking place that involves the law in you know, a small town in, in, in the middle of Oklahoma or a, 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 pr a problem that's popped up in California that you didn't know about or something that hasn't already been written about in the New York Times. That's a, that's a tough one uh, to get past that. Uh, but um, what we try to do is, is to elucidate and tell stories, exactly as she was saying. Tell stories about lawyers, tell, tell a story that people haven't heard or put, uh, put some kind of uh, fo focus on a particular story they have heard in a way that they hadn't heard it. And lawyers like that too. I mean, we have different sections of the magazine, we go with history, all of that. So, I mean, we try to target that. Then there's a broader context, and that's the platform system. Uh, we, we, we Twitter what we do, and that allows people, as I said earlier, to, 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 to drill down into the stories. Uh, we have a 24-7 website that, that we, we aggregate some stories from other sources and people gather there. Uh, they, can, they can read the magazine on their, their phone if they want to and the trick is to, to create stories that people are likely to be interested in and then ha have as many ways as you can for them to access those stories. I think the biggest part uh, that, that's the change in, in the way we're trying to reach out is the platform issue. I mean, you know, I'm, we're covering law, we're covering legal affairs. I mean, I'm not going to write about Justin Bieber because I'm trying to get a different demographic. I mean, it's just, that's not part of it. But, unless he has legal trouble. Yes, which he, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was getting deported to Canada. Um, so, you know, but, uh, what it has forced me to do is kind of adapt and, and blend. So, and I'll explain an example of how to do that, but there was a question this morning about covering, I think it was from Beth, about Twitter. And, you know, is that the way you cover a trial? And, and, and I use Twitter, um, but when I've covered trials, we have this platform they created for blogging. And I felt that Twitter was just a little too idiotic for me to cover a trial because I can't give you analysis, I can't have fun with it. And so forth. So, for example, I mean, I, I, I had a blast in a couple of the trials, but like Apple Samsung, it's a patent trial. You cannot be drier than that. But you do things like when the billion dollar verdict came in, you know, and you're blogging and you're kind of doing it. I remember I, I had a blog item, which I just looked up again this morning, where I said Samsung's lawyer just asked for some water. I wonder if he's going to splash a little bourbon in there. You know, it's like, so you can do that in a way, and that doesn't mean that, you know, I did a huge, serious story on the case for that weekend, but you, you create a little entertainment, and, you know, certainly as I went on in that blog, analysis about how it's going to go to the federal circuit and, and so forth, but you can kind of hopefully 
spice it up for everybody. The same was true with the Barry Bonds trial. I could give people a legal perspective about that case that they couldn't get from those sports writers, but yet, you know, I'm a huge sports guy. I can, I can blend that. We had huge readership for that one. So you've got to think about that in a way that we didn't before when we're crafting that basic story, court story that we used to do. I, I think it's just, you've got to be able to be a little more dynamic about the different ways you approach it. The only thing I'd add is it seems to me that we're going through this era of disaggregation, which is to say it used to be, if you subscribe to the New York Times, you would get a curated overview of the events of yesterday. And our idea was that you'd read it start to finish and you'd go out into the world and you'd be a good citizen. Uh, and all of those stories were pretty good. And many of them were not the best stories on that particular topic. And now people can go find easily their own little newspaper of the best baseball story, the best whatever. And I think that means we have to up our game and offer readers something distinctive. So that I find that my routine, uh, you know, decision story in a, in a B-level Supreme Court case has a readership of half a dozen people. But if you can, um, if you can write about something different uh, with a little voice, perspective, analysis, that, that rises out of that crowd and you, make, you can make a claim that you, you, you yourself are a kind of destination that someone might want to keep track of, even if they don't read the whole soup to nuts menu of the New York Times, then you've done something. And I actually want to take this question that I may and flip it, actually. There's a lot of young folks here. Um, we've been sort of pontificating about what we think um, we're going to do to address you as an audience. Uh, how are we doing? <laughs> in other words, let me put it this way. I mean, what is it that you would want to read in a legal story, really? And what would get you to read something? Not being an issue story. <laughs> <Not being> an <laughs> issue story. <laughs> Spoken like a true law student, but there's still life after law school. Do um, any of you read a daily newspaper? That's honest. It's a question that I am always asked yeah. to speak at San Jose State's journalism class. And I always start out by asking who reads a newspaper. And it's like, you know, two hands, this is out of maybe 40 students, something like that. It's, I, I'm always curious because I can start that way because it's to me, that, that, that's where we're headed. Those are the readers. I mean, these are journalism students, too. And the numbers are scant. Keith, you had a. I'd like to address both of those. Yeah. If you ask if we read a you know, daily newspaper, that may not be the case, but do we read the news daily? Right. The second is yes. I would say that most people do read the news daily, and that it's it's a little bit different than a daily newspaper. How do you find it? Uh, personally. Yeah, uh, personally. Through Reddit or Google News. Yeah. Well, I always it, and it's it's, it's a great point because then I do go on. So do you do Google News? Do you do Twitter? Do you do Facebook? You know, where do you get your news sources? Because you're right, and that's why we should still be okay in the long run is that people are still reading their stuff. They're just not getting it on their doorstep anymore. I think the publishers may differ because if the advertising model doesn't fix itself, the freeloader problem will put us all in a pine box. I would add one log to that fire too, that when we talk about competition among you know, information sources, we're talking not only among news outlets, but also among government agencies. You know, which would become much more direct and effective at distributing their information directly to you, you know, using the multiple platforms that, as news organizations, we're trying to use too. Uh, and I think unique among them in terms of um, its lack of adoption is the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, you can contact the court by phone, fax, or they've got a website. And the website today is much, much better than it was 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, but I, when I was talking to the public information officer about the court's plans, if any, uh, to adopt you know, new technology, Plan to ever have a Twitter feed? Have you thought about you know, creating a Facebook page? Uh, the answer was a very quick and direct no, that there's not enough support upstairs for that. Um, and you know, when I said, well, what do you mean upstairs? She said, well, you know, these decisions are made by the chief and you know, not, not interested right now. So let me just kind of come back to this yes. question. Yes. What would it take to get you to read Adam Lipton in the New York Times? Better writing. <laughs> Better writing. <laughs> And uh, no, seriously, it's, this, is, this is a real, uh, this is a very serious question. Yeah. Well, um, I like what was said about when you blend multiple experiences. So if you're an attorney and a journalist and you know about sports and you pull that all together, those are, 
whenever I'm looking for what I want to read about coverage of a particular case or an issue, I, I look for really well-rounded articles that bring in a lot of different perspectives. Would you and think, that are entertaining. Would you think to go to the New York Times website? I'll, I mean, I'll go anywhere. I'm, <laughs> I'm like a master Googler. Okay. And yeah. I uh, do the Wall Street Journal. So is it really is it really just platform? I mean, I, I think Twitter is really important. I that's my go-to primarily. Where I, get, I mean, I, I get links to the Times or the Washington Post or the St. Louis Post Dispatch. But I, I mean, I'll wake up in the morning and I'll get right on Twitter and I'll just start scrolling. And I mean, that'll take me to you know these the digital sites of these papers. But I think that it's important to have a strong presence on on, on a network. Addy H. Mintz, by the way. Excellent, excellent. Let me check that Guys, what, yeah. do any of you pay for any form of news? Or Spoken like a true publisher. Yeah. I made a $15 a month for the online. Wall Street Journal. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of the Wall Street Journal, I, I, I teach data journalism for the first time this semester, and I, I don't have a textbook. My textbook is the Wall Street Journal. Not because it's any better than any other paper, but because that's where I used to work and that's where I can give the students my clips and I can tell them how I got the stories. Long story short, we got a deal. Every professor can get the same deal, $15. <coughs> print version online is free. Several of my students, rather than taking the deal I set up, went and bought the online version on their own for $15, the exact same price, because the print version by their behavior, has zero value. I, I taught a class a couple of years ago uh, with Steve Brill, who was a big legal publisher, and Floyd Abrams, who was a big First Amendment guy. And we, uh, we decided we would try and experiment, and we assigned the class the task of reading the New York Times. Just go out and buy the Thursday New York Times, come to class. And it was like telling them they should send a telegram. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and the kids came back and said, this is really interesting. There was a lot of stuff in there, and there was stuff in there that I wouldn't have known to look for. They didn't use the word, but there's this serendipitous experience. If some editor thought I might be interested in this, I would never have thought I'd be interested in it, but I was. Will you ever read it again? Two dollars for a piece of paper? <laughs> Please. <laughs> you know, we have, an, we have an aggregating service in Missouri. Um, it, it focuses on political headlines, and it's very, very popular. And I've noticed that recently, when they put up the daily list of headlines, and, and they'll always sort of say which source it's coming from and then what the headline is, they started marking the stories. There are some that get little red marks behind them, and they're basically saying these are subscription only, and you know, or, you're, or it's one of those things where you only get like 10 free yeah. views a month or whatever. And then they put little, little green marks next to the ones where whether it's the, the news outlet's own choice or whether it's an agreement that they made with this particular aggregator, that people who click through will be able to see this otherwise proprietary content for free. And, and I saw that and I thought, well, that's really interesting. And it's like you're getting a grade from the news aggregator as to how you choose, what business model you choose to follow. And I mean, kind of give a little shameless plug to Richard's publications. As I've seen the number of, of experienced reporters dwindling in our state capital. Um, we still have some, some really great people left, but one was given 10 inches to write a story about a bill that was introduced that would make it a crime for a federal agent to enforce a federal gun law. And he was given 10 inches to write about that. That's, that's not very much room to write about a pretty serious topic. Richard's paper is able to actually do enterprise journalism and to look much deeper into some of these stories, but it's, it's a publication to pay for. I mean, I think it's worth paying for, but I don't know if the students in the room will ever get an opportunity to see that kind of content or if you're going to be stuck with the 10-inch story or maybe the 2-inch story that you got for free. Those aggregators, by the way, are kind of a two-edged sword. We have one in California called Rough and Tumble, and it's, everything's free, and, and we sort of don't mind it because the whole thing is, as you point mm -hmm. out, just eyeballs on it, it's clicks. I mean, mm -hmm. every day now we get little reports, I don't know if you had this at the time, you show us uh, our personal reports, how many page views each story got, and so forth. That's how it's measured. Um, and so... Oh, know, would I not like to see that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really weird, because some of the stuff that you, you, 
you know, that you work so hard on, you get bumpkiss, and then yeah. you write some dumb story about there was a court, a court of appeals Justin decision. Justin Bieber. <laughs> yeah, Justin, oh, Justin Bieber's my yeah, so. Um, and, you know, and there's some of the legal blogs, like how appealing, you know, is an aggregator that, you know, my stuff lines up all over the country, so why is that a bad thing? But it's free to click on. So it's it's a it's an interesting. So here's here's my question. It, it, it sort of repeats the question before, but if you could you raise your hand if you have a paid news account somewhere? Paid. One, two, three. Very four. Oh, yeah. Very bright. Street. How many of you have a paid Spotify account or paid um, music account? This one. Okay. I was just curious. <laughs> what? There are poor Pandora. Hello. Yeah. So, well, man, this. Yeah. No, this is this is this is a huge issue, and, and really going forward, um, and I and I say this in all seriousness, even at the end of the day on a on a, on a Friday, uh, after a um, truly remarkable uh, sort of set of, uh, uh, of presentations. I mean, this this right here is 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 the challenge that that we face going forward. Getting you to read, getting us to be able to, to, to write at a level so that, so that the, uh, the coverage of the law, the coverage of the courts is gonna be both accessible and meaningful uh, to the next generation of people who are gonna be entrusted with our democracy and, and our rule of law. Uh, that, that goes to the core of Charles' concerns about, about uh, access and, Investigative reporting. I mean, that's all of this boils down really to just this last conversation that we just had. So, on that note, I want to thank all of you who uh, who have stuck with us to the end, and and especially want to thank all of our panelists who have traveled, uh, you know, sometimes multiple time zones uh, to to make it back. Um, I've got a couple of thank yous to um, to, to make before we uh, before we close. First of all, I don't know if she's here. Either of them are here, but. But there are two people who worked behind the scenes. It would have been absolutely impossible to have, have pulled this off without Robin Nichols in the dean's office, as well as uh, Casey Baker in external affairs. Um, you know, they just did so much that made it all uh, all possible. Um, our deans, Dean Myers, uh, Dean Mills, um, and Randy picked all of whom supported it. And uh, last but really, really not least, my colleague in crime over here. Uh, Peter uh, Peter Bay, uh, Peter just worked tirelessly, endlessly. He put in a lot of time on this, and, and it was it was all a fast turnaround time. I'm like, hey, can you get this right now? And he, he did just fabulously. So he and the rest of the law review, who have taken such good care of our guests and who will take such good care of of their uh, articles, um, we, we we do pretty well on that. Uh, um, thank you all, and. Um, our next stop, we've got about a half an hour for everybody to kind of air out a little bit, talk, do whatever you need to do. Um, let's go ahead and plan on meeting in the lobby at 4.20 uh, for those of you who want to take the uh, uh, tour of the journalism school. It's really pretty cool. Uh, and so we're going to have an advance for doing that. And um, I should do that. You should do that, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is where Davis' desk was. <laughs> Charles Davis slept here. Or the place went down. But, um, uh, so at 420, and the reception is going to be at 5 over at the J School. It's going to be really nice. So um, thank you all. Have a great day.